Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronish from jbiztechvalley.com and Statewide News. We have a very, very special guest with us, Mr. Harry Rosenfeld. He's the editor of the Times Union, and we, he has so many things to talk about, but Harry, welcome to the Jewish View. Thank you for having me. Well, yeah. let's start even from the beginning, from your youth. I mean, you st where you were born. Tell us where you were born, and, and we'll uh, hear a very, very interesting story even before you came to the United States. Well, I would love to tell you, but first I need to correct you a little bit. I was the editor of the He's editor Times Union. I'm editor at large, right. okay. which is sort of emeritus status. Right. <laughs> I was born in Germany in 1929. My parents were Poles. They had come to uh, Germany some roughly 20 years earlier. My father in 1917 during the First World War, when he had been recruited by a very high fashion house as a furrier. He was a furrier, a young man. And my mother joined him a couple of years later after they had married in Warsaw, which was their hometown. And they lived in Germany until we were able to leave it in April of 1939, so roughly 20 years. Now, uh, you, you were nine years old when Kristallnacht happened, and you have a book out now called From Kristallnacht to Watergate. And in a, the next episode of this uh, TV show, we're going to talk about Watergate, but for now, we want to talk about Kristallnacht and the, uh, the Night of the Shattered Glass, or uh, can you, you know, I think that's what it means. So I, I talk to us about... I think beforehand, yeah. like what was life, you know, living in Germany? Germany I mean, right. again, you were nine years old, right. so you were still a little boy, but right. still, did you feel like, oh, the anti-Semitism? Really, well, Hitler came to power just for our viewers in 1933, so even beforehand, you were living in the, under Nazi Germany for five years before even Kristallnacht happened. That's absolutely right, Rabbi. Uh, a, Chris, uh, a colleague of mine had, has said it so very well. Anti-Semitism in Germany was like the water in an aquarium. It was all around you, it suffused you. So even as a child, and after all, the Nazis were active since the end of World War I, and I was born in 29, so they were pretty active even by the time I was born. And by the time I, I had any wits, right, I, I was introduced into an atmosphere, into an environment where anti-Semitism was a, a, a defining ingredient for Jews in Germany, even though we were Polish Jews. Uh, and uh, in fact, if it hadn't been there, I would have missed it. It wouldn't have been my, the world that I grew up in. So I was accustomed to the slights to the harassments that would occur from time to time. Give me examples when you were a boy. Oh, oh well, there weren't terribly many. I don't want to tell you that I was abused from morning till night, but you know, it, it would come up, you're a Jew boy, or the German equivalent thereof, or you're this, or you're a Jew this, and you're a Jew that. And you were allowed to go to public schools? We were allowed to go readings. to public schools. I was allowed to go till 1937. I believe I was allowed to go that late because I was a Polish Jew. I believe the German Jews had been expelled earlier from the public schools. But in 1937, I was expelled from the Volksschule, and my sister, who was in the gymnasium, she's eight and a half years older, uh, uh, was expelled from the, from the gymnasium which she attended. And it ended her education. But the Jewish community did not permit our education to end because we were thrown out of the public schools, they had set up their own uh, school system. And I went dutifully, if, if reluctantly, to, to uh, my school, which was attached to the Fasanenstrasse Temple, which was an enormous edifice, which was built in the early 20th century. In which city again? Berlin. You were in Berlin. I was always in Berlin. And we, uh, this was a synagogue that was supposed to be symbolic of German integration into German national life. And when it was dedicated, Kaiser Wilhelm, who was then on the throne, made some sort of extravagant gift to it. I don't remember what it was, 
but it showed you that this was the high watermark of Germans being proud, German Jews being proud of being Germans, right? Uh, the saying was uh, Germans of Jewish belief. And, and uh, so it was so ironic that when it came to Kristallnacht, Mm-hmm. The Fasanenstrasse Temple was ordered directly by Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister who was in charge of Kristallna. He instructed his minions, who were reluctant because of this prestigious mm. building historically, to do anything, to touch it. He says, no, go take care of that. Or, I don't know his exact words, but he instructed them to destroy the temple. And it was destroyed? It was, it was yeah. substantially destroyed. If you go to Berlin today, what you will see there is not a temple, not even an, an edifice resembling the grand structure that once was there, but you see a wall, much like the wall in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Yes, and it is now the site of the Jewish, a Jewish community center in Berlin. Mm-hmm. But for me, Kristallnacht, and what I mean by Kristallnacht, began about three weeks or so before November 9th, which was the night of Kristallnacht, mm-hmm. November 10th. Now, you were nine years old, but you said that your father, since he was a furrier, was very, um, w- was give, uh, thought of in high regard, and well, his store wasn't touched during well, that Well, night. let me explain yeah, that. Sure. Um, he was held in high regard by his customers. He was an excellent furrier, and he made a very good living even through tough times, even through Nazi times, uh, because he was such a skilled craftsman. And, um, but he was a Polish national. Mm-hmm. And in October, and later in the month of October, the Gestapo came to our door in the middle of the night, roused the sleeping household with knocks, and said they were taking my father away. They wouldn't tell us why. They were polite. They were not in any way personally offensive. And they took him away. Of course, I broke up in hysteria with my poor sister, eight and a half years younger. We were, you know, we cried. We were devastated. I mean, we had, we had known persecution and discrimination and segregation, yes. But we had never known directly as a family what had just happened. My mother then instructed my sister, Razy, to follow my dad to the police station, where she saw lots of people, some of, none of whom she knew. And she asked the policeman, what's going on? And he, he too said, I can't tell you that, but I can tell you, go home, pack a little valise for your father with a change of clothing. She did this, she came back, and when she came back, he was already on an open truck that was beginning to move, and Razy handed him the police, the police. Yeah. which my mother at the last minute, she also put in a big loaf of bread. Oh. <laughs> For three days, we did not know what had happened to my father. We were besides ourselves. After three days, he phoned. He was in Warsaw. He was at the home of my mother's elder sister, and he was safe. He was more than safe. He had been extraordinarily lucky because he had been on one of three trains that the Poles permitted to cross their frontier with the, with the Jews that were being exported yeah. by the Germans. The other trains, housing thousands more desperate Jews, were discharged into a no man's land between Germany and Poland. It was October, mm-hmm. the weather was raw, and besides that, the, the German and the Polish forces were hostile. So many people died. Wow. Oh, they certainly all suffered. They, because he was a Polish Jew, they, That's right. they allowed him to... There, were, there were some intricacies there, that, uh, some technical details. The Poles were saying that if you're an expatriate uh, uh, Pole, you could no longer be, uh, hold Polish citizenship, and the Germans didn't want to keep the Polish Jews, hmm. so they kept them. That was it. That was the bureaucratic rationale, but that's not why Kristallnacht happened. I didn't know it then, sure. and I didn't know it for many years, but I know it now, because so much has been discovered and unearthed. This was a deliberate plan by the Nazis, 
different factions within the Nazi party to uh, seize Jewish assets, to uh, get Jews to flee, and to persecute. To my way of thinking, looking at it with eyes from our present day, this was the major red line before the Holocaust. This was the prelude to the Holocaust because when the Nazis saw they could have get away with this, Kristallnacht, this is Kristallnacht mm -hmm. that I'm talking about, yeah. then, then why couldn't they get away with, right? Right, sure. Now, why was your father's store not touched? Oh, well, we spent the day in the Polish embassy because we had been alerted by a friend who had connections in Goebbels' office, and, and we fled to the Polish embassy, and at night the Poles told us it's safe to go to your home. I don't know why our store and apartment were not attached. The apartment was attached to the store. Uh, was it up above? No, no. it was attached. in the back. Okay. So the, the, the store was in the front facing the street, the yeah. apartment was in the back, and in Germany there was a courtyard, you uh -huh. know, so it wasn't like a tenement. These were mm -hmm. nice houses. Nice house. And I mean, look, we were just saying it's five years under Nazi control. Did your parents ever think, you know, and there were, I mean, again, you were there, and I just read reports about it, Obviously, a lot of German Jews saw the Nazis. They saw, like what you're saying, the persecution. Let's get out of here, and they did flee. And um, actually, those are my 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 father-in-law. He passed away, but that was his family. Just immediately in '33, and people were telling him his father, ah, things will get better. You know, it's a little rough now. And he says, no, things aren't not going to get better. Kind of what you were saying. I know the German mind. It isn't going to get better. And then they. Well, whatever, they have a story going to Italy, to America, but I'm asking, did your parents ever think, hey, of course they did. pretty bad, let's get out of here? I mean, they, they, as early as 1934, they put in an application at the American Embassy to emigrate to America. Both my parents had brothers, sisters, cousins in this country since the First World War, you know, mm -hmm. so at the end of the First World War. So uh, in 1934, they put in their papers. But as you well know, there were very strong anti-Semites in charge at the State Department. They had the quota numbers for the polls. The quota numbers for polls were small to begin with by an act of Congress that intended to keep polls, whether Jewish or not, out of the country. And these anti-Semites then even prevented those permits that were available from being issued because they explicitly did not want Jews in this country. And that so, was under the FDR administration. And that is under FDR. And this is well established. I'm not uh, blowing smoke here. You right. can get the name of these people. That they've been long identified and as long agreed to and that they saying, were conscious anti-Semites. And you once told me, you said it was the FDR State Department that wanted to do this, but was it handed down the, from FDR himself personally? Or? I do not know that, and no. I, I never have any suggestion of that. I would say to you that it was tolerated by him. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if he didn't uh, know about it, well then shame on him. Right. Right? Right. Uh, um, so, so 1934, yeah. they apply, and we don't get the papers until 1939. But That's five years. Accept, but they finally, America accepted you to... They finally got the quota number, and my father was permitted now to return from Warsaw, where he went, was as a deportee, to come back to Berlin to accompany us to the United States because we now had the papers that would remove us from Germany. Wow, how long had it been since your father uh, went to He Poland left, he was, he was picked up toward the end of October, October right. and he came back in March. So six months, let's Something say. Something like whatever That you missed is. your father. It's two, uh, it's five months, something like that. Yeah, but that must have been an emotional reunion. Well, of course it was yeah. emotional. All of a sudden, my father was gone. My mother's a very strong woman. She ran the store. The oh. store never opened again. You asked, we've, we've, we shifted away conversationally. Yeah. Why wasn't our store harm? Well, for one thing, it was shuttered. But it always was shuttered. Normally, a first store was shuttered with heavy shutters I that see. came down at the end of the business day. For another, the man who warned us tore our nameplate off the 
entrance to our apartment door. Yeah. For another, it turns out later that the Nazis had instructed leave foreign Jews alone. Was it that? Was it this? Was it a combination? Who knows? Combination. My sister thinks that our neighbors liked us hmm. and didn't turn us into the, the thugs that were going through the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I don't know no. why. Yeah. I know that our apartment was not touched, and I remember my mother saying, on the walk home, did I lose the? Yes. On the walk home from the embassy that night. Put it in there. And we, and we walked uh, mm -hmm. along the streets that were, where the shattered glass was at our feet, right? And, and uh, she said, I hope everything is smashed. I hope there's nothing left. Now, she was a true bourgeoisie. She, she, she was, uh, she had beautiful Art Deco, ebony and mahogany furniture. She had beautiful porcelain and crystal. And for her to say, I hope everything is smashed, showed me, even as a nine-year-old, yeah. that this was a woman with some backbone who had a very strong sense of values, right? What mattered most was not her possessions. Um, but nothing was destroyed. So. There we were. Did, I hope the, I've answered your well, question. Well, yeah, describe, you mentioned that the glass was all at your feet, yes. it was all over. Describe that a little bit more, well, what I your saw feeling one, was. Well, I, I, we just walked home, we were not molested. On our walk home, nobody bothered us. We walked home with a number of other people. I'm certain people knew we were Jewish, mm -hmm. uh, you know, could see we were Jewish, and they knew what had been going on. Uh, the next morning, I nagged my mother, I wanted to go see what had happened to the temple where I went to school. And I remember I was nine years old. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I convinced her to let me go with a friend. Uh -huh. Now, I wouldn't let my kids go at right. the age of nine, I promise you that. But my mother, my mother let me. You were a I, mature nine-year-old. <laughs> I can only tell you the fact. I, know, I can't I, read no, minds. I understand. Uh, and, good, good newspaper. Uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> And we walked there and we saw, I saw, well, this is what I remember. Right. There was a large crowd watching the temple burn. I could see the smoke rising through the dome. It was like a Moorish dome. And there were a lot of firemen and their equipment standing by. And that's they it, were not there just to put out the fire. Mm. They were there to keep other houses, non-Jewish properties from catching fire. I also remember, or I think I remember, that this large crowd, vastly non-Jewish, was watched in silence. They didn't cheer, and they didn't protest. They stood there in silence. That, anyway, is my memory. How, now, in today, do you harbor any ill will towards any Germans? Would you buy a German vehicle? Would you buy, buy anything that said made in Germany? I have bought a German vehicle, uh -huh. and, and, and a colleague at the Washington Post, when I bought it, said, as long as they're making cars, they're not making mischief. Uh, no, of course not. I mean, you, would ha you have to would go into an inner rage, which I'm not above, but when I'm being rational, there is no possible way. And I, I would fault people who are now the grandchildren, or even perhaps the great-grandchildren for things that their great-great-parents did. And when you read stories that there was a, a Nazi war criminal who just died at age 101, I believe. 100, yeah. So, yeah. What, um, you know, what do you think? You know, do you say, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I think I justice just, delayed is just a deny, like. What, I don't, I don't think saying. he received justice right. in any term that I would consider house arrest is not justice. Um, there is no perfect justice. Right. We're old enough to know that. Um, what do I think? I think that the Italian faction that celebrates Nazis and that is an, an argument with the papacy because of the Vatican Council decree that Jews are not to be held, uh, the descendants of Jews are not mm -hmm. to be held liable for the 
uh, crucifixion of Christ, and these are people protesting that, those are the people that get to me. And you, I mean, every, I think everyone in Germany at the and time... And I don't know why the Catholic Church tolerates them. I don't know why they want to absorb them. But you know what? That's the business of the Catholic Church. Right. That's not my business. Exactly. Uh, also, when you, were, when you were growing up in Berlin, I guess everyone was an Orthodox Jew, right? Not true. Not true. Not, not true. Okay. The, so, the Fasanistrasse Temple was a liberal temple. It was a liberal temple. Yes. Okay, so was it a reform? I mean, how would we describe reform. it today? Reform. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I was very... Uh, yeah, most German Jews were reformed. There were, like, what they brought to Washington Heights today, the... There were Orthodox yeah. Jews, and there were Orthodox Jews in, in Berlin, but, and, and we belonged to the, when we were, when my parents worshipped, which was only occasionally on the High Holy Days, uh, they went uh, with other Eastern Jews and they rented space in a, in a German Jewish synagogue in the basement, sort of, and, and they prayed in the fashion that they were accustomed to praying. I see. So when, so that's, and now you're, You've remained a reformed Jew. You're a member of Congregation Beth Emmeth. Well, it's more complicated than that. When we came to America, we were conservative Jews, as we were in Germany. Oh. And, and I was educated at Jacob H.F. Center, which was a conservative synagogue in Bar Mitzvah there. Where was that? In, in the Bronx. In the Bronx. Off Fordham Road. And, but when we came, then our first synagogue in in, in New Jersey, where we lived for a while, was a conservative synagogue. But when we came to Washington, and we had children, and they went to this Hebrew school in the conservative synagogue that we automatically uh, went to, they did not like uh, the way they were being treated there. And that's when we became Reform. I see. Because they did like the Reform Temple in where we lived, and we have been Reformed Jews ever since. And but there's one second. And when we, you go back in Germany, like, it's really from the beginning of your talk, do you ever think, like, really, the Jewish people were integrated into German society? I mean, you said that... Oh, I don't know. know that. I was nine well, years old. I didn't well, think about integration. Well, maybe, not, maybe not your idea, but, you know, looking back at history, you know, how could it be that where the Jewish people were... Maybe not accepted, but like I said, they were in high positions in the government, or, you know, like you say, they weren't that anti-Semitic, your parents, furriers, you know, that they could rise up and be so, it's not just anti-Semitic, oh, you're a dirty Jew, but obviously bringing people into gas chambers, I mean, you know, the most radical and extremist anti-Semitism you can imagine. How could it be specifically there? That's such a question that I have that, in Germany, where, and also they're sophisticated. You wouldn't see they're like barbarians, uneducated. They were the most educated people in the world in Germany at that time, an advanced society, and can perpetuate such incredible low, I mean, obviously most evil actions against human beings. Well, that has been discussed fully by scholars and mm -hmm. historians and and moralists, and, and every question you raise is absolutely on point. But it's not a question that a nine-year-old entertained mm -hmm. and, and, and even had any notion of. Um, but it is a valid question, and it's a question that all humanity must face, because the murder of the Jews was not the only genocide. There have been other genocides, hope not as extensive as that, as sufficiently carried out as that of the Jews, but we have lived through Rwanda and Cambodia and many other things that qualify as genocide. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, it's not only the Germans. It is the Germans, made more imperative and ironical because it was the Germans, because they were well-educated, because they were disciplined. Well, the Germans killed 10 million Christians in the Holocaust along with the six million Jews, but there were more uh, c uh, Christians or Catholics uh, killed. I'm the, not aware yeah. of that. Oh, yeah. That that's they a, killed in a genocide 10 million Christians. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't a genocide. It wasn't perpetual, let's kill Christians. No, but they were. That's a genocide. I mean, they did kill, like you're saying, but part of, of other yeah. people. But I know my, but, my Italian friends, uh, their parents say to me, I, I'm it's not just six million Jews. You know, we were. There were a lot of Catholics killed in that, you know. Well, there were a lot of people killed in the war. Yeah. 
That's true, yeah. but I don't know where that 10 million figure comes from. Or else it wasn't yeah. genocidal. Like, okay. let's go out and wipe out a and race. Yes, that's right. It was, I mean, this was, a, that's what, this was a matter of when it got to extremes, which happened after we left, of course. Uh, uh, then it was simply the act of being Jews. I mean, even when we were in Spain, right? right. They gave us a choice, convert and you're right. okay. Right, right. But the Germans never said convert and you're okay. They tracked you to your grandparents. Let me ask you, when did your parents pass away approximately? A while ago. Yeah, but My we father were... was 89, my mother was 72. And It's they a were... long while ago. Right, but how old were they in 19, what, you came They here? were in their 40s. They were in their 40s, so they had 40 good years here in the United States. Right. Oh, that's good to know. I was just, so from their point of view, they lived half a life under... Well, consider, in, you know, my father half, began right. life in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh -huh. I don't know that it was a get called the ghetto at that time, but it was the ghetto. Yeah. It's where poor Jews lived in, in one or two rooms in the most primitive condition. My mother was the daughter of a, of a well-to-do family. I don't even know how two people from such disparate world could have met. My father stopped schooling at the age of, uh, schooling at the age of nine. Mm. My mother went to a gymnasium. That's like a two-year college. Wow. How did they still get together? I don't know. My sister doesn't know. Why? We didn't ask. Right, right. We weren't interested while they were alive, and they never told us. Well, personally, my grandparents wouldn't talk about the. Well, the yeah, World my, War my II parents didn't Holocaust. volunteer anything either. No. Do you. F um, I don't know. I just, I, I just think that your memories and what you. is so valuable for the future generations. I just. It was so. I feel so blessed well, that you, you were know, here to be able to remember that such, in such crystal clear. Um, well, some things you remember yeah. very clearly. Another thing I remember, apropos of my German experience, I want to talk about Gustav, my playmate. Uh -huh. and we were friends about the time of Kristallnacht, it must have been. I think we must have met in the Jewish community school. I don't know this for sure. He was a Jewish person, Gustav? Yes, Gustav Löwenstein. And we were buddies. For all I know, he was my friend who went with me to see the temple burn mm. on Kristall. I, don't, I can't say for sure. sure, I'm guessing. He lived with his father with a Jewish family. The, the parents had been divorced. And one day we were playing in his, in this apartment where they, where they were the boarders. And the family told us we had to hush up because the father of the house was being returned from incarceration in a concentration camp. And I remember as I look at you, I see this image clearly in my mind. Wow. We, were at, we hushed up and we we're standing at the end of a long dark hallway. And at the other end, the front door opened and this man huddled over, being assisted by two male relatives, was sort of half dragged through the door, very, very pale, haggard. And I remember that. No, that'll never get. That will wow. never leave my mind. Wow. And and uh, I also came to remember Gustav, who, whose name I had forgotten, but not whose existence I had always remembered. When I was reminded of many many years later, I was already an old man in retirement, when his American cousin called me, and then I found out Gustav's fate, oh. which had been. First, with his father, to be in a work camp in Berlin before they were deported to Estonia, where they both were killed by oh, the Nazis. Wow. You know, we're out of time. Yeah. Mr. Harry Rosenfeld, editor of Large Times Union, it was incredible that, you know, I mean, they even say World War II veterans are a dying breed, literally. And, um, you know, we wish you a lot of good, happy, healthy years to come. So glad that. You know, like that, this generation today understands and shouldn't be just a distant memory or faded memory that they should know what happened to the Jewish people and all humanity. Anybody watching the show should really understand it because these things are perpetuated. Unfortunately, it's not old history. That's right. It's current events, too, and I mean, not in Germany, but so who cares? I mean, it's in other places in the world, and they shouldn't happen again. People should be educated. You've got to be careful and vigilant. 
to you know to be good and to be um, justice in the world. So thank, thank you, you for very take, much. thank you for taking the time. I do appreciate it. Well, I thank you both for inviting me.